throughout the entirety of its existence, the Alliance to Restore the Republic was faced with what was perhaps the most daunting objective in galactic history. To bring about the end of Palpatine's empire, a scattered coalition of idealists, mercenaries, pirates, and smugglers would need to achieve a decisive triumph over the military apparatus that fought through the Clone Wars to absolute victory. An overwhelming force that in victory had not only rejected any type of demobilization, but rather actually expanded its forces to secure in peacetime what had been won in war. Without legions of obedient droids, a colossal starfleet, or even broad support across the galaxy, the Rebellion would need to succeed where even the Confederacy of Independent Systems could not. To do this, the Alliance would need to fight a different type of war. There would be no great campaigns, no static front lines, but instead, a decentralized network of rebel cells embracing ambushes, sabotage, raids, and hit-and-run tactics. It would be an unconventional and especially dangerous type of war, and one perfectly suited to the Rebel Alliance Starfighter Corps. While many uncoordinated groups of Rebel Starfighters existed across the galaxy since the end of the Clone Wars, their consolidation into a single organized force was only achieved some 17 years later. Even so, this Starfighter Corps existed mainly on paper, with the Rebellion still unable to concentrate its forces and achieve any type of standardization. Despite this, Alliance Starfighters were able to achieve remarkable early successes, driven in part by the Rebellion's military doctrine. Knowing that attempting to match the Empire's numerical advantage was futile, the Alliance leadership instead prioritized starfighters that emphasized survivability, cost-effectiveness, and most critically, hyperdrive capability. Not only would this allow rebel pilots to survive situations their Imperial counterparts might not, but in doing so, veteran pilots could build the institutional knowledge of the Corps, allowing rookie pilots to integrate and acquire experience quickly. The Alliance was initially hard-pressed to find starfighters that met their stringent requirements, instead taking whatever they could get. But as the Galactic Empire began replacing its oldest equipment in favor of new models, the Rebellion was able to make use of several retired designs. Both the Z-95 Headhunter, an adaptable, well-regarded snub fighter, and the BTL Y-Wing, a heavily armed and armored bomber, were outdated relics of the Clone Wars, but uniquely suited to service in the Rebellion. Easy to repair, and built in such numbers that finding spare parts was not an issue, these two starfighters were critical components of the early Rebellion. These models were later joined by a smaller number of UT-60D U-Wings. A hybrid transport and gunship, U-Wings quickly proved their worth and versatility, but were never available in larger numbers. It was only through the political machinations of Senator and secret rebel leader Bail Organa that a small number of the craft were secretly sent to rebel forces. While the U-Wing would not be a major factor in the Starfighter Corps, the reason behind its limited production run would end up being essential to the Alliance's survival. The U-Wing was one of the last models produced by the Incom Corporation before its nationalization by the Galactic Empire. A prominent designer of well-regarded starfighters and speeders, Incom's design was seen by the Empire as ill-suited to their shifting starfighter doctrine, which prioritized speed and armament at the expense of protection. Existing production lines, including the U-Wing, were cancelled and Incom increasingly sidelined in favor of the rival company, Sinar Fleet Systems. But where Incom's starfighters were incongruous with Imperial military thinking, they were almost perfectly suited for the Rebel Alliance. Furthermore, Incom's nationalization and poor treatment by the Imperial military industrial complex made its corporate leadership sympathetic to the Rebel cause. With the clandestine support of the Incom Corporation, the Alliance was given the prototype models and technical specifications 
for the T-65 X-Wing. A single-seat fighter, its near-perfect balance of speed, protection, and firepower, combined with its onboard hyperdrive, made the X-Wing one of the most highly respected in military history. Armed with a nascent fleet of T-65s, but the ability to produce more, it would become the defining symbol of both the Alliance Starfighter Corps and the Rebellion as a whole. The deployment of X-Wings brought a new range of capabilities to the Starfighter Corps, and proved especially competent during the Battle of Scarif against its primary rival, the Thai LN Starfighter. It was the destruction of the DS-1 orbital battle station, however, that truly cemented the Rebellion as a credible force and truly invigorated its pilots. In a victory over Yavin 4, said to have been guided by the will of the force itself, a depleted and ragged force of 22 X-Wings and 8 Y-Wings, still recovering from the Battle of Scarif, were able to miraculously destroy the single greatest concentration of Imperial power in the galaxy. Although any purported supernatural element can most likely be dismissed as misidentification by weary pilots and overzealous Alliance propaganda, this victory was nevertheless transformative in scope. No longer able to be dismissed as a poor, under-equipped fringe group, the Rebel Alliance attracted renewed attention from the Imperial military, but also a whole host of volunteer pilots. In the space of a year, the Starfighter Corps dramatically expanded in both the overall size and diversity of its forces. New models of Starfighters were acquired, and the deployment of previously obtained equipment was made more viable. One such craft was the RZ-1 A-Wing, which had been present in the Alliance's inventory since the Declaration of Rebellion. An evolution of the Republic-era Delta-7 Aetherspite it was faster than even the vaunted TIE Interceptor, but considered a particular challenge to fly. With the induction of new pilots came those willing to master the A-Wing, and following the Battle of Yavin, it became a prominent fixture of the Starfighter Corps. The ASF-01B Wing Starfighter followed a similar trajectory, exalted by rebel analysts as one of the most heavily armored starfighters in the galaxy the B-Wing had been active only within a few Rebel cells. After Yavin, and the continued consolidation of Rebel forces, the B-Wing began to be fielded in greater numbers. Rebel ingenuity and tactics would be again displayed during the Battle of Hoth, in which modified T-47 airspeeders successfully brought down Imperial ATATs and protected the evacuation of Rebel forces. It was in the Battle of Endor, however, one of the last battles of the Rebellion, that the true potential of the Alliance Starfighter Corps was put into action. In a moment that had once been unthinkable, a collection of former Rebel cells were unified into a single armada, and in one great effort, destroyed the second Death Star, ended the reign of the Emperor, and set in motion the collapse of the Galactic Empire. Nearly always outnumbered, under-equipped, and ill-supplied, the Alliance Starfighter Corps nevertheless displayed a superb level of ability and maintained a high morale for the majority of the Galactic Civil War. This is in part due to the ability of Alliance Starfighter Command to adeptly recognize the strengths and capabilities of their own forces, and their willingness to incentivize individual initiative. What began as a necessity for any decentralized organization had the natural benefit of ensuring gifted pilots rose to a place of authority and leadership. Through the course of the war, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Wedge Antilles, Biggs Darklighter, Horton Salm, Arvel Krynid, and a whole host of other pilots became not only war heroes and legends, but instructors. Through their experience, each was able to train or influence a new generation of pilots, and likely more valuable than even the few dedicated flight schools the Rebellion was able to establish on Faste or Homan. These pilots and others that achieved victory over Endor and across the greater galaxy would fight a further series of battles before their eventual triumph, but from then on, they would do so not as rebels, but as citizens 
of the New Republic. Attention pilots! The Templin Institute is mustering all wings in preparation for the launch of Star Wars Squadrons. If you have any flight experience or are force sensitive, please report to our Discord server where we'll hopefully be hosting a variety of community games over the next few weeks and months. Additionally, we'll be broadcasting the action over on Twitch, so be sure to head over there as well. Good luck, and may the Force be with us all.